say that not only from a standpoint of my uh, long time in uh, this field contributing, uh, because I started in 1974. Then I cloud back in two years in 1977. At that time, we had only one competition, and that was the University of Duke University with Professor Wilson and later Professor Owen. They, they were not professors originally, both of them, they were working in industry and they had their own company. And then they started a Duke University program a couple of years before Professor Mirbrook in 1968, trying to build, bring high frequency into the power conversion. So I'm not saying that there are no other universities uh, doing power electronics, but at that time, power electronics was silicon control rectifiers and, you know, few kilohertz and so on. Even when the, I started in 1974-76 and made the first design, we were doing a buck converter at uh, four kilohertz and six kilohertz, not even 20 kilohertz because bipolar devices couldn't handle it. And not only that, cores had the problem uh, with uh, sinking and so on because the crack and all other stuff. Uh, while I'm bringing that, at that time, there was only one uh, conference in the world, first power electronics of high frequency. Actually, Caltech was the second university which started the academic program in power electronics. And uh, he started with Professor Mirbrook in 1970 as a consultant, and he started in 72 at Caltech. First conference of high frequency power electronics, sort of modern power electronics was at MIT. And the second one was um, at Caltech where Professor Miller was chairman. And what happened in the second in 1972, they still call the conference power, um, power um, conditioning conference. And then everybody was saying, wow, this sounds more like air conditioning, doesn't say anything high, high tech and uh, fancy. So they changed it to Power Electronics Specialist Conference after two, three different title chains. Uh, also what I'm trying to uh, impart on you, at that time, we who were doing this uh, uh, conference, uh, presenting the papers, conferences had a three presentation in the morning, afternoon, one hour presentation, half an hour discussion. Uh, in uh, two days, there were what, 12 papers and so on. And that was a conference then. There was proceedings and we were not publishing this in any other um, uh, journals. Now this whole field is totally, uh, uh, how do you say, out of whack in my mind. Well, just give you an example. Last uh, Power Electronic Specialist Conference, no more, doesn't exist. 30 years ago, they decided to change the name and call it uh, uh, ECCE, Electronic Conversion Conference Expo, whatever. Fancy name, but it was basically what was the Power Electronic Special Conference before. At the same time, 33 years ago, in 1988, uh, Applied Power Electronics Conference started. And you know what is happening now? Just for these two conferences, given it, there was a proliferation of papers, and you would think that now with the uh, ECC conference in October, which was online, it had a thousand papers. Each paper had a three or four or five authors. Uh, so there's 5,000 people on it. Uh, Power Electronics, uh, uh, Applied Paratonics Conference is coming in June this year, and it's going to be also thousand paper presentations and uh, 16 seminars of three hours each. And all of these conferences are just for making money and hiding behind the tax exempt status. Don't teach anything. I had a people who told me, they said, Dr. Chuk, I didn't want to come to APEC and I uh, wanted to get your courses, but my company wouldn't let me. And they actually insisted that I uh, go to the conferences rather than spend a week. That time I was giving one week conference, a one week presentation. So compare what you can learn from me in the six weeks of 80 lecture hours, you will have to pay 
$50,000 per year for tuition at any uh, leading conferences, leading colleges in the United States. And I tell you, half of that will be wrong. I'm not saying facetiously because I know what they're teaching, okay? And I know also that there is no criticism of anything. That's why when I was at the conference in APEC in 2019, you know, I, I couldn't stand it and I got up and say, well, the guy who self-appointed himself to tell a state of a, um, power electronics research at universities, there are 100 universities in each one worldwide. And each one has a three or four professor. I had, a, as I told you, a Barkar, I had a three of my former students who are professors at the just Boulder and let alone 12 or other places. And disaster is because uh, the system is made uh, just for money. Uh, there is no uh, criticism allowed because every paper presented uh, for IEEE means 33 bucks uh, that you have to pay to get a copy of it. Okay. And how much you learn for this uh, power electronics journal, one out of 38 societies of IEEE with half a million people, 150,000 people are in the power electronics nominally. Out of, so they charge $250 per year membership. So they make a billion dollars money just for uh, for, uh, for that and what they don't they are they don't pay taxes and you know they run everything for free why because all the reviewers which used to be uh, professionals who are paid to be reviewed they are now volunteers you know quote and what the volunteers do they want to just have a portal on which they are going to expose themselves as a consultant. I had the last year, the guy, Eric Person said, oh, 20 years ago, I didn't know anything in power electronics. And I kind of put out, I, do, I want to give a course there. And he said, I did a course there just because I wanted to, I didn't have a job and I wanted to get exposure for my consulting business. That is what is happening in the power electronics now. The people are abusing system grossly. And you guys who are working in the field, you don't see the left from the right. Okay, you don't see how much you are being exploited and not learning anything. Okay, and paying tremendous man, uh, money for it. My own daughter was actually uh, helping uh, on an editor for some of this chemical engineering, whatever she's electrical engineer, uh, uh, signed up as an editor. And as a main editor, she has a couple of others who are helping. Get a three thousand dollars a year for uh, to do the job, but then at least you're doing the job. You know, not doing this fake volunteer. And do you know what the fake volunteer? They present. They stop people like me talking and present and criticize me. I went in a 2019 conference with a thousand people on a plenary session, and I made comments. And just as I started making comments, the guy who was making presentation, who has no standing in the field whatsoever, doing the for last. Uh, 15 years, quote, doing PhD with my former students who are professor at Boulder, you know, the same one that you get. And then he gave a sign, like cut off, and they cut off my microphone. Can you believe it? What is happening in this field? Shame on power electronics. And you guys are young and you have to stand up and fight against it. Don't allow that to happen, you know, because this field is already degraded with monopoly of all these companies. Which I've been look, you know, look at all this: Google, Facebook, Amazon, even Apple. What they are producing, you know, they are overcharging and not producing anything. They they are producing advertising, okay? And IEEE is not in uh, in uh, education business either. You know, they are hiding behind that, behind all these volunteers, and they have a couple of people who are paid, but they are not. Uh, uh, expert. They know nothing about power electronics, so they can't even uh, judge anything or, or uh, how you say, uh, guide the field in the right direction, except they, they agree. You know, when I confronted these people at the power electronics in 2019, I said, what are you guys are doing? You're cutting a microphone. What's happening? No problem. You know, they, they just want exposure and they want to continue the same way. And I think this field is dramatically going down. I am doing my best to 
try to educate. Now there is a tremendous opportunity to educate the whole world. Look, you have some of you, are, I, I don't see yet here, but some of you are coming from New Zealand, you know, coming at three o'clock in the morning to, uh, to attend my class. Luckily enough, I think what in India, I think it's uh, 12 hours difference, 11. So eight o'clock in the morning is seven in the evening your time in Europe. Surgeon, you are nine hours difference, right? So it's a- uh, Yes, it's five o'clock now. Five o'clock to seven in the evening. Just just after you've done the work for a company in the United States, at least on the East Coast, West Coast, it's eight to 10 in the morning. Well, no, but no engineers come uh, to work at, uh, at eight. And not only that, now you don't have to drive. So you can stay in the first two hours while you're doing breakfast, you can have a lecture, you know? And um, so it is convenient, but I don't understand this is uh, this whole field is now uh, overtaken by all this look, power electronic uh, transaction of power electronics. You know how many uh, uh, articles published every month? There is 1,200 pages. That's a 15,000 pages. And I was uh, I was in a conference in the 2017 in. Uh, APEC in, the, in the Florida, and I was flabbergasted what, what kind of stuff is being presented and talked about. You know, it just, uh, there is no criticism whatsoever. Everything gets published and, uh, and it is, uh, you know, you can't even, you, you know, it, it's, uh, you can't even find papers anymore because 99% of that is something that you shouldn't even spend the time looking over it, you know? And that's what it is. So, uh, however, uh, I have my own uh, genuine desire to help this field. However, without your help, I can't do much. Okay. And uh, if I if I don't uh, uh, have a follow up, and I'm just putting you right clear now, uh, that I am uh, already signed up to uh, the courses. Uh, my six weeks course that I set up as attractive things to educate the whole world in power electronics. I set it up uh, from May 3rd for a six weeks. Okay. However, if you guys uh, don't get the following up, I'm not gonna do it anymore. This is gonna be my last course. Then I'm sorry, you have to do what you like. Free courses for Coursera, Udemy, and you get what you pay for. Okay, and uh, because I have much better things to do with my time and which is two things. Uh, next course that I'm doing, it, but, uh, whoever shows up, I don't really care anymore. I'm preparing every day two hours lecture, which I want to make sure to leave for the whole Polytronics community, the textbook, how the Polytronics and that is what, what is my mission in the next six weeks. Whoever joins, they'll have a benefit of all tremendous material which have access to it, uh, directly my lectures uh, that I'll be preparing every day. And out of that, they will come out to text. Uh, what exciting is uh, I am now at the point that uh, I have for the first time realized that, time, that in the last few years, I probably made uh, uh, more advancement with my uh, new inventions that I did for the last 30 or 40 years. And why? Because I am now to the point that I, I mastered so much power electronics that uh, any new ideas, I have now tools. And I'll teach you in this course. Some of the tools are like, uh, like um, how to use uh, simulation programs. Uh, that was, I think, one area which was tremendously neglected because it's suffering from uh, uh, convergence problems, suffering for accuracy, suffering from many other things, and it's generally not that useful. Because it outgrowed on the SPICE programs, which are really designed for a IC circuit, you know, where you have million transistors, so you have to have a computer with a very detailed model of each switch, or analog or digital, uh, to come up with the 
working model. Power electronics had only switch and on resistance of the MOSFET device, and then had the, you know, the uh, one uh, Brazilian capacitor trade to source, which you can put as external capacitor. But then, if you have a right circuit, that method, can, uh, I said, you can um, uh, end up eliminating switching losses. High voltage devices, you need a high voltage, uh, zero voltage switching. So you need a pair on a primary. On a secondary, you typically rectifier, which is a low voltage, which in itself, a low voltage where the diode is not significant loss, but even better, you can make uh, the, the second operate in zero current switching. So, but you know what the field is doing now? Oh, we don't care that. You know, we have a calcium nitride device. So you can operate it at five, 10 nanoseconds on time and off time, and now operate it hard switching. What a stupidity. What a stupidity. And then you can operate at 50 kilohertz with or 500 kilohertz at MOSFET, or with at least 50 mega, 5 megahertz on 50 mega. They know, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay. And they are driving this field in the wrong direction for the last 30 years. Because I tell you what you learn in the course, hopefully to the, uh, last time I gave some uh, input to it. In fact, it is already in my video that you had all access. Uh, power electronics field has two big problems. And I will go now into it. One big problem is uh, that isolated converters and transformer never done in the proper way. They were uh, uh, opted uh, to something like, how you say, protected against saturation, but they are not. I discussed it last time. Other bigger, bigger problems, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and I proved that decisively by uh, forces two years ago, three years ago. The back boost and flyback converter should have never been invented. They are something which is uh, long and uh, and uh, uh, which is really a reason. You know what's the reason that we are operating with uh, five megahertz and twenty megahertz and so on? Reason back boost and Speakers, you know, can you uh, fix that? Okay, stop. All right. Uh, let me tell you what the problem is. And I'll give you the very, very uh, real, uh, my own experience and feedback. Back in uh, 1970s, you know, when uh, Apple came out with the first uh, uh, Apple one, and then after that, they had uh, the Apple Lisa, Lisa computer, which is $10,000 computer. And you know what? They use the they use the flyback converter for a 150 watt triple output. And you know what was a, a story? The the they use that, and in fact, Apple not only was a, one of the first computer uh, which had the easy to use uh, you know software and was very popular, but they were the first one to use switching power supplies for it. One of the Apple one was the first one with the switching power supply for it. And then when they had the Lisa computer, there was a company in the uh, um, Bay Area, Selectron, and they were making Atari games. And that time they were making IBM these drives and they were in contract manufacturing and they were making uh, the, they're making the power supplies uh, uh, for Lisa computer, 150 watt flyback. And I got contacted with these people at that time, I got a chip converter, isolated, uh, triple output, integral magnetics, and what? My magnetics was just one magnetic piece. Input inductor was one leg of EI core, uh, triple output inductor was filtering on the other leg of uh, EI core, and the center leg was transformer with the primary and three secondary, one magnetics. Okay, reduced the size, weight, uh, and so on. And 150 watt. And of course, and just like all the other converters, 
The problem was when you have a filtering inductors, uh, you have a DC current here. And if you just think about it, five volts, three amps, if it were one output, five volt, three amps, 151, that inductor alone adds 20 kilohertz because that was a name of a game at that time. We got to switch at 20 kilohertz because there was no better bipolar devices that the best were 20 kilohertz. At 20 kilohertz, because it depends on that, you got to put air gap, which is one millimeter. You know, how much is one millimeter a gap? Nothing, right? But ferrite core, which had a relative permeability of 2000, it effectively have effective permeability of two. Thousand times killed inductance with one millimeter air gap at 20 kilohertz. And three amps only, five volt, three amps, 151. And you know what happened? We designed it and Solectron manufactured 200 prototype for Lisa. And what happened? It all came back. It worked. We had only one problem. Ripple on the output was not 50 millivolts, but it was 125 millivolts. So why? And we found the reason. You know what was the reason? The company which was manufacturing it didn't notice that we defined a pot core with the air gap built into it of one millimeter. You know, you can define at that time pot core and say, I want to center a gap of a pot core to have one millimeter. That's what we needed, right? Otherwise, it'll saturate at three amps. And when a magnetic core saturates, it's a short. It's not large inductance, it's a short. You don't want to have a short in your switching circuit instead of inductance. And, but what happened? It worked. You know why? Because at, uh, when a core saturated, it was left with what? It was left with the native inductance as the core, when the core saturates, it doesn't contribute anything to inductance. So it becomes an air core inductance. And in fact, it becomes a nuisance because this core which saturates still carries the core losses and it has a weight and losses. And the reason why the core has air gap, air gap is there, uh, core, Magnetic core is there just to define a small air gap. <laughs> but the, when, uh, when they used ungapped core, they used ungapped core. So therefore inductance of the ungapped core because it was fully saturated was inductance of the, of the air core inductor. And that was, and core only contributed two and a half times to inductance, you see? So that's why instead of 50 millivolts, it was 125 millivolts, disaster. That's when I realized we are doing something wrong in power electronic. And that's what I called AAA at the time. They didn't do their job. They should have been 1945, 50, when the first transistor uh, showed up, bipolar and MOSFET, each transistor, each switch had its own separate symbol. Did they do anything for inductors in the back boost and the flyback? They should have put a sign on it. This is not an AC inductor with a uh, Faraday invent, Faraday and indir indirectly, but actually confirmed with Tesla, which invented alternating current component called an AC inductor. And that is a big difference. And I had even, not to name, blame famous professor keeping the lectures and I was, of courses at some time as I was doing mine and the people taking his courses told me, hey, the professor didn't know you have to put air gap in the inductors in the back and boost converter. Otherwise it will saturate. That was the state where we are. Uh, uh, IEEE didn't put a notice. This is not an inductor. This is not an AC inductor. Inductor, they kept the same symbol and that's a problem. So everybody felt, oh, that's inductor. Even professor in schools teaching that, they thought this is an alternative current inductor. It wasn't. And that propagated to transformer. That's why the people then started saying transformer, well, flyback converter, it's a transformer. It will step up and step down. 
voltage and, and all that, but they don't know this is not a transformer. Transformer is, uh, I have recently came up to one other interesting thing, which I will um, share with you, maybe uh, time to use my pen and, uh, and uh, drawings, but um, the, uh, you know how this uh, LinkedIn and all these uh, networks propagate with lots of people giving lectures. And I recently ran into one that the fellow put a DC battery and put a transformer with a trans ratio and on the secondary put a resistance. And he gets a whole lecture of half an hour how this DC voltage on the input will be transferred at trans ratio of the transformer into the voltage on the output and then divide by, uh, find the, uh, what that voltage on the output by terms ratio, divide by resistance on the output, say this is power on uh, output, and then now if reflected on input will be input power. All operating on DC. I gave you the lecture last time. Didn't you see in my lecture last time that what is needed for a transformer, you have to have an AC alternating current inductor, which is playing a role on magnetized inductors. Is this the only place which does this mistake? I'm been fighting now, frankly, and I have no reason to say that. Uh, not, to, not to mention one of the leading companies, which I adopted for my power electronics simulation as the only company which makes sense, which is a Plex from Plexim, and they use the model for a transformer, turns ratio model. I said, that's not a transformer. You can't use that. You have to put a, on a primary of that transformer, you have to put an inductance. And then when you do simulation, if your simulation shows that that inductance has a zero average current, then that is a transformer. Other than that, it is not transformer. It is a flyback inductor which stores energy. And, and of course, how do they in simulation? They said, oh, we don't need the inductance there. We'll just uh, use ideal transition transformer as a model of transformer. And you know what the problem with that is? Oh, what did I do? Okay, so. Uh, okay, all right, no, no. It just touched the, uh, on my screen. Uh, anyway, so what, what do they do? Of course, you can use a trans ratio, ideal transformer with the magnet without magnetism inductance. You can use it as a, how do you say, uh, 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 simulation wise, you can reflect everything from a secondary side to the primary side and operate like nothing happened. You don't need that inductance there, but you need it because that's not a transformer. You need to prove to yourself that's not a transformer. The last time I showed you, how I solved that problem with the true converter because I split that floating capacitance into two. And when I put inductance in the center, that inductance uh, is shown to be both a flux balance, which you need to prevent against saturation due to the flux imbalance, but also charge balance because each capacitor has its own charge balance. And I told them, look, if you use that kind of, and tell people to model a circuit with power electronics, where, where they use the transformer with just a turns ratio and not uh, with the magnet as inductant, I could invent a thousand different converters and it would be great converters, but all of them, uh, if I use that without magnet as inductance, will be wrong. They wouldn't exist. You couldn't build it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so let me get now back to a point that I uh, want to continue here and then give you some uh, starting point of, about a transformer uh, where we stopped last time.